This is Elizabeth Gilmore with Energetics. We do energy modeling and consulting. Welcome. And we have Ian Wilson. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm an associate principal with 4240 Architecture here in Denver. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, and Sean, go ahead. I didn't get to you. Hi everyone, Sean Denniston with New Buildings Institute. We've been the primary technical advisor to the city through this process. Thank you, Sean. Okay, so these, just to sort of center all of our thinking, these working groups, this is one of four working groups that I'm helping to facilitate right now, but I don't pretend to be a subject matter expert on all of the code work, um, but we're trying to really spend a little bit more time with these working groups developing code proposals that will go back to the full IECC code committee for approval in July. So I think this one, as I mentioned at the top before everyone had joined, is a little bit simpler than the work before some of the other working groups. I'm um, hopeful we might not actually need all four meetings for this one, but we've held them on your calendars just in case. And the real goal of this working group is to think through um, the commercial prescriptive pathway and their proposals around uh, modifications uh, to the commercial prescriptive pathway. And the goal there, um, well, and then all the other the other proposal that we're going to look at is a minimum renewable proposal that would require all buildings, prescriptive or modeled, all commercial buildings to do a certain amount of renewables or else some other options like electrification, uh, efficiency, um, other uh, offsite renewables. Uh, so they have some flexibility and we'll just want to find the right um, straight, how to strike the right balance in both of these proposals so that buildings that are built in Denver are sort of on the path to, you know, we want to take a step towards our goal of net zero energy by 2030. We also want buildings to succeed after they're built with meeting the energized Denver performance requirements. And I think everybody on this call is really familiar with those, but uh, that's why Sharon is here in particular, as we think through how renewables should work in code, we want to make sure we're thinking about um, how renewables may count then under the performance policy. So I think for today, I'd like to propose that we start uh, working through the proposals that are part of, um, let me pull up my agenda. Uh, so we have two two proposals before this group. I think the C406 proposal would be where I would propose we start, and then we can get into the C405 proposal around minimum renewables second. Um, they are distinct enough conversations that I think it's going to be easier to sort of shape one, which is just about C406 and how the prescriptive path works for uh, commercial buildings that are chosen the prescriptive path and how C406 points work. And then, and I think it's a smaller chunk of work um, based on all my conversations and background with Courtney on this. And then we can turn to the C405 proposal around minimum renewables. Um, and so any thoughts on that from the rest of the group in terms of just how we, how we go about our work together and pause there or what our task is, anything anyone wants to add, you know, Eric in particular, anything, anything you or your team want to add in terms of just what's the task of this group? Oh, uh, I don't, nothing additional, Katrina, you've covered it well, and so trying to advance these to the point where they're, you know, well supported and the committee can prove them as, as the ultimate goal. So thank you for those that have joined and looking to uh, try to make that happen in this in this working group. Good. Okay, well then I'd like to pass it over to Sean to walk us through the C406 proposal and to frame, and I'll try to help frame what I think some of the challenges are that we heard from the larger code committee. So this is why we've sort of formed this working group, um, because we have a couple things we just need to wrestle with. 
All right, thanks, Katrina. So we'll start with looking at kind of the importance of C406 proposals for this next code cycle. So what you're seeing on your screen is a chart that shows the progress of various model codes and the Denver energy code relative, um, you know, just over time. And this is plotted in terms of uh, carbon emissions. So if you look, you can see that if we're looking at carbon, the um, 2019 Denver Energy Code, which is that blue dot right above the bright green dot, um, actually is on track for meeting the implementation plan goals. Uh, it was a little bit behind on energy alone, but once we look at it in terms of carbon, we're on track. So if we go one code cycle over where we are now, 2022, uh, you see that there are two dots and the the lower dot represents, you know, if we adopted everything that was proposed, then that's where we would be. Uh, the upper dot represents if we adopt everything that the committee has passed so far, which is actually just a, a small impact, plus these stringency um, requirements that are reflected in C406 then you can see the progress that we make toward Denver's goals. Uh, the orange dot that's just up and to the left, that's the IECC 2021. That gives you a, a fairly decent idea of the base code, the model code that Denver is starting with. Uh, if you lower that just a little bit, you would see what it is now because we are seeing some decarbonizing effect from the grid alone. So that gives us some general um, background on what this proposal is meant to do, you can see that the stringency improvements in efficiency from the prescriptive path, which is C406, and then from the modeling path, which we're not talking about, but they need to be calibrated together, are responsible for a fair amount of uh, progress toward Denver's goals. And right now, the proposal as it's written is written in you know, reflecting the implementation's um, goals for energy efficiency in this code cycle. So that gives us a little bit of background. I think some of you have probably seen this quite a few times and maybe some of you haven't seen it at all, but we wanted to check in with it first. And before I go over to the proposal itself, are there any questions about this, especially for anyone who hasn't seen this kind of level setting before? All right, then let's go ahead and jump over and look at the proposal. So the C406 proposal is really a series of proposals. And I want to give a little bit of background on that before getting into the main one. I think here's our agenda. It's probably a little small for you all to see. Can everyone see that OK? Does it need to be bigger? So uh, Sean put the link to the uh, more condensed agenda in a link. Great. Thing. So for C406, we have a series of agendas that do a couple of things. Number 10, number 12, number 16, number 101, and number 8 are primarily concerned with giving us more options in C406, recognizing that we're going to be using C406 to get more efficiency out of the code, we want to make sure that we've maximized the number of opportunities that we have to get points. So those five don't change string the stringency of the code anymore. They really just add flexibility. The main one that we want to talk about is number six. This is, make sure that I pick up the right one. This is the one that actually would change the stringency of the prescriptive path in the code. And this proposal does three main things I'll say. I think this is going to be a good overview way to look at it. Uh, the first one is that it just makes C406 Denver specific. Right now, C406, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, is this additional efficiency credits um, section in the code where you have to choose from a bunch of options that are each worth a different number of credits to achieve a certain amount of credits in your building. In the IECC, that number of credits is 10, and that represents about two and a half percent efficiency of improved efficiency in the building. Since the IECC is a national code, of course, it's got all the climate zones. We don't need all the climate zones. So the first thing is to just condense all of these multiple tables 
for multiple building types and multiple climate zones into a single table that just has our multiple bu um, building types. So that's just a cleaning up thing. The second thing that it does is instead of requiring just 10 points, it sets separate um, credit targets for different building types. In the implementation plan, one of the things that NBI did an analysis of Denver's building stock, uh, looking at kind of code stringencies, and because the IECC doesn't impact all building types the same, but Denver's goals are the same for all building types, it means that different building types are closer or farther away from Denver's ultimate goals. And that means that different building types kind of need to make a different level of progress in each code cycle to get there. And that's what this table does is it sets unique targets for the different building types to get all the building types there in the end. And if we look at the far right column, that's where you can see. So we both calibrate it based on building types and then also calibrate it to Denver's goals, which brings us to the third thing that this proposal does, which is that it encourages electrification by allowing all electric buildings to go through C406, just getting the 10 credits from the base code. So right now, the base code requires 10 credits. All electric buildings would only need to do 10 credits. All other building types, they're the ones that would have to have this increased efficiency above the base code. Those are the three big things that this proposal does. And when we look at that table that I skipped over, earlier, and I skipped over it for a reason, we can see what the final C406 table would look like if we added in all of those options from all of those other proposals. And um, so we have a full suite of proposals. You'll see that not all, you know, the, the different measures don't have the same impact in all building types. That's because different efficiency measures impact different building types differently. <clears throat> and sometimes it's NA. And that means that either the, the savings are negligible or we don't have a way to quantify them. And that's the basic overview of, of the proposal. And I think probably, you know, the big questions are going to revolve around those three issues. And we can go into that discussion now. Thank you, Sean. Can everyone hear me OK? I got our. I believe I got our conference system working in the room I'm in. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um, so thank you for all that background. I would love to hear from folks in the working group about what questions you think we need to work on regarding this proposal. I'll flag the one that Courtney said was discussed by the full committee. Um, I think and see if I get this right, Courtney, I'll let you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that generally this proposal was pretty well supported by the full committee. There were just some questions about how many points building types receive for the lines you can see here, the electric space heating and electric water heating, because today, well, the way these points are for some building types, if they did electric space heat and electric water heat, that would get them all the points they need. And so it becomes easier to just do electric space heat and electric water heat than to do all electric plus the 10 points that are required for an all electric building. And so there's just a little bit of points calibration where I think they can Courtney flagged the committee wanted a little more discussion. Is there anything else you want to just call out that we know uh, the group needs to work on, Courtney, or do you want to define that any further? And then I'd love to hear from others um, what they think we as a working group need to tackle, because uh, my sense is this one is pretty close to being in a place where the committee was pretty comfortable with it. Yeah, thanks, Katrina. I think the points about calibration is certainly um, a main point of topic. I would just clarify that it was maybe hard to under, fully understand if the committee was or wasn't on board based on the 
feedback we received. We received a lot of great questions, um, but it was a little bit hard to tell maybe where everyone was um, at. So that's why I just love this group to kind of talk through those questions and if they're, um, you know, how we can move forward on those topics as well. Um, calibration again being probably one of the biggest and understanding the calibration. I think that's what's um, going to be really helpful moving forward. Um, just understanding the big picture of um, what it requires and making sure that buildings um, like Sean explained why buildings aren't all necessarily treated the same, but trying to get to a point where um, that calibration makes sense for for building types. Um, again, the partial electrification, making sure we're incentivizing all electric over partial electrification. How do we calibrate that appropriately? Um, just um, and making sure that people understand there's a lot of flexibility here um, to to move forward so that it can work for their projects. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into some more questions and details uh, in next week. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Courtney. I'd love to hear from that. That's really helpful. It's uh, I think it will help the larger committee to know that this group has really looked at this proposal and vetted it and broadly said this makes sense. Um, it's in line with Denver's net zero goal that helps set buildings up for success with energy in Denver, and it's actually achievable for each of these different building categories across you know, projects that, that folks can think of. Um, yeah, so I'd love to hear from others. What else might you need to understand? What Questions do you have to sort of get to a place where we're comfortable as a group saying that to the code committee? What issues might we need to work through? I guess on that note, are there any questions back to Sean so that we can like fully understand this proposal um, in order to answer Katrina's questions about what else do we need to know? Are there any clarifying questions you want to ask, uh, Sean? Um, is it possible to separate this between what's going in the Denver Building Code and what's going in the Denver Green Code and deal with those separately? It's it's difficult to discern which is which. Elizabeth, you mean within the actual proposal PDF itself? Yeah, I, I mean, can they can they be completely can these just be split not in the PDF, but sep, com, as separate issues and deal with the Denver building code first and then let the Denver green code be layered on top of that? It just becomes too complicated of a question trying to do both at once. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I think that's the intent of this. We would focus on the building code and then the Denver Green Code would always be that layer on top. So figuring out the stringency for base first and then seeing where the Denver Green Code should go from there. So I, I'd say at least we should focus our conversation uh, on the base code today. Yeah, this working group is really only trying to develop recommendations for the base code committee. I do think we can revisit Denver Green Code, but let's focus just on base code for this conversation. Does that help, Elizabeth? What questions might you have then with that focus? Well, since the amendment addresses both, uh, I mean, can these be two separate amendments? I, I guess I'm not uh, not sure how we deal with one without the other unless you split them. Yeah, so Elizabeth, maybe I can just speak to that from a process perspective. Um, the, the proposal uh, will be heard by the IECC committee, and because the IECC is mandatory code, um, the committee is obviously looking to vote to accept or not accept the language into the IECC. When it comes to the green code, um, the idea there is to set essentially a, a higher bar, a higher standard, 
Um, and as as you know, the green code uh, is and will remain uh, for the for this you know coming code cycle that we're in, uh, essentially a voluntary document. Um, so they're only presented in the same proposal here, uh, just for continuity and comparison. Um, but in terms of uh, how Katrina had responded earlier, um, we would really just be uh, voting to approve um, the IECC uh, amended language uh, with this with this proposal. Does that help or not help? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, it, I, I guess I'm not sure how that will appear when it comes up for vote and this language is uh, that all the Denver Green Code language is still in there. If we haven't discussed that part. So we have we have a separate committee for a green code that would be voting on that green code language. Um, and it's it's included here simply for comparison versus having two separate documents. The other aspect of consideration that is important is that if the language of the IECC is not approved, uh, it would likely result in revisions to what has been proposed for the green code so that there's not a, a mismatch uh, associated with stringency or information uh, in one code versus the other. Um, but regardless of the position that the IECC committee takes, um, that will not uh, by default result in uh, acceptance or denial of the green code provisions. And then for, for the discussion of, I guess, the impact on stringency, um, you know, you're seeing credits here. Just keep in mind that each credit is worth basically 0.25% of efficiency gains. So we're looking at eight, basically about eight to 12% efficiency gains across the different building types. And this credit structure is what's in 2021. So some of you might be familiar with the old package approach, which was in the, the previous version of the IECC. So this approach of taking credit, of using credits is not unique to Denver. It is something that comes out of the model code. So that the question of stringency, I think would be probably one of the big ones that would be useful to hear back on is whether this level of stringency, you know, feedback about this level of stringency uh, improvement in this code cycle. Can I ask, I think we're getting hesitation. I see we're getting hesitation. Um, can I ask Elizabeth and Ian in particular, what is making you hesitate? I know not as many buildings follow the prescriptive path. Is it, so I, I don't want to speculate. You tell me um, maybe why, are you really here to talk about the minimum renewable proposal? Um, and you think this one's just fine or you feel like we should have other people in the room because you don't build buildings that uh, sort of follow this path. I guess I'm wondering in particular from our, our stakeholders, um, I feel like we might be asking the wrong questions. Feel free to tell us if so. Well, I guess it's it's hard to know how how this is going to fit in with everything else, uh, you know, with C four hundred seven and all the other prescriptive things. It it feels like this should be last. To, uh, so I I guess it's a little hard to. Uh, to know exactly how to comment on it without knowing uh, all of the foundation that it's going to be resting on, you know? Yeah, um, that's, that's really helpful. 
Like, uh, you would I, love to know, like, how the modeling pathway for C407 has come out to be able to really comment on what the prescriptive path should be to align with it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and partly, and, and as you mentioned, like, the credit about uh, renewable energy itself, or I should say the requirement about renewable energy itself, you know, how is that going to align with this? I know everybody's, you know, assuring us that, yeah, these will all be calibrated, but, you know, until we know what that really means it's it's hard to to comment on it um yeah. i yeah i have i have no problem with the structure itself you know as sean pointed out it it's exactly in the model code right now so you know that's what we would all be dealing with anyways uh i know there'll be a lot of questions about you know, these other building types and where those numbers come from like for example the numbers in the model code for our climate zone basically are aligning with your your group B occupancy almost verbatim, I think, actually exactly verbatim. So what is that? Uh, you know, what are we getting then from Denver uh, here? Uh, and like, are we changing any of these numbers? And uh, where where do the group R and I and group E and group M, like where do those numbers come from? Why do those different from the, the model code? Um, you know, people are going to want resources about what that what that means and where, where's that comes from, where that comes from. Okay, I also, yeah. I'm I'm yeah. still, I don't see the relationship like in in this table that you've got up here. You know, why is mid rise so different from high rise and hotels and small hotel? Like, where where does all this come from? So this is the part that comes from the implementation plan. And as, as I was discussing before, how because the code doesn't deliver, the, the IACC doesn't actually deliver the same level of performance in different buildings. Um, it's really been focused on medium offices through most of its history. And you know that's why this medium office is the least aggressive. It's because the code has done the most to improve performance in medium office, while other building types have not advanced the same way. So the, the implementation plan includes an analysis of what the model code stringency results in for different building types and how that relates to Denver's ultimate goal for all building types. And so different building types will need to improve at different rates over the next, you know, was it three code cycles, the intervening code cycles to be able to all end up at Denver's ultimate goal. So that's that's the reason for putting a, a different requirement for different building types. If we look at the value of the different measures that are in C406, those come, except for the new ones that are being either added or modified by the other proposals, those come straight out of um, the, the tables that are being deleted here, you know, because they have all these extra climate zones that Denver doesn't need. Right. No, I, I understand the logic, but we'd like to see the actual resources. You know, why are we calculating 53 for mid-rise and 40 for high-rise? What we, We'd like data. Call me cynical, but <laughs> that's what, yeah, that was part of the discussion when this first came up. It's like, well, where, where does 53 come from? What's, what's the you know, what's, what's our sources on that? Can we cite something? Where do these numbers come from? Uh, I understand the logic, but we I, we want to get our we want to get under the hood. So the data is in the implementation plan. Or at least the summary of the data is in the implementation plan as, as well as the method. Yeah, I, I think we've actually requested that, but I have not seen it. So I don't know if that's something that can be shared. Yeah, that's how I think we can pull that up, make sure that it sounds like you want kind of actual spreadsheets. How are the calculations done? Right. Elizabeth, and make sure that because I'm not, you know, the implementation plan is a PDF. So I think the methodology is described. Um, so we can send you that piece of it and maybe just check in on like, is there more that you would want? Because I think we can share more detail behind it if needed. Yeah, I know that's been requested by some other modelers, so just be aware it will be probably requested again. Okay. Bef before folks have confidence in 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 these numbers and feel like they're really 
kind of serving serving what we're what we're trying to achieve. So, Elizabeth, the the implementation plan has been well, it was shared with the committee. I don't know if it's been shared with this working group and it is on Denver's website. So are you looking for more detail than is in the implementation plan or have you not had a chance to look at the implementation plan? But well, that's just like a, a PDF, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to get under the hood with all the calculations and, and everything that that goes into that. And, and maybe there's more in the implementation plan than I've that I've seen, but. Yeah, Sean, I think we want to. Um, I mean, that that looks like be... it's a lot of words in there, but not a lot of spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah, spreadsheets is I was going to say if we can share those uh, with this working group and others, I think that's uh, what it will us fit into. There was a more in-depth technical paper that I, I think the the implementation plan includes the more high level. So um, I know that the, the city does have the, the, the deeper technical paper, paper on the process. We can uh, dig that up and see if there's anything else that might be needed too. So that's really helpful feedback, Elizabeth. I also heard just that you are thinking that um, it's hard to think about this in the absence of knowing what's going to happen with C407 with the minimum renewable conversation we're going to have, right? Like it all sort of has to fit together. So maybe we actually, I'd love to hear from Chuck and Ian or others, Eric, like, does that make sense to you as a proposed approach? And then maybe we come back to this proposal at the end. The last meeting of this working group will be after the last meeting of the C407 working group. So we should have a recommendation around how modeling is going to work so that um, I think we can, we've always said like, oh, well, the C406 has to be calibrated to the model pathway, right? So we can look at that, the numbers and the analysis and see if the calibration is right, I would imagine, in the last meeting of this group. Um, but do others like that idea in terms of process on this set of proposals so that this group can say, yeah, we're comfortable with these numbers um, at the end? I, yeah, I, th I think at least for me that sort of feels how the like the process should be. And so just to give you an example here, you know, one of the one of the credits here is for on-site renewable energy, which is, you know, a certain uh, energy offset and a certain point total. Um, if C407 is uh, written such that there's no limit to how much renewable energy you're allowed to use to meet the code, would we then expand this to match? Um, would we you know, it split that with with different points to make it more um, matchy matchy with <laughs> with how some of the other options for for meeting the code, if that makes sense. Yep. I saw Chuck, you came off mute. Do you want to chime in also? Yeah, no, I agree with Elizabeth. I think a lot of the consternation amongst the committee was just the lack of ability to get our hands around substantiation that um, a lot of us are very technically oriented and actually enjoy the detail. And so the more we can provide, the better. Um, my only items with this proposal are, I mean, I know the base code just has an all other category and the all other categories used here. And that just incorporates such a wide variety of low energy use buildings, restaurants, assembly spaces, um, and it's just, I just don't know how equitable it is to throw them all, throw all, them all in the same bucket. And that may be based on just lack of data or lack of um, ability to separate the, the buildings through um, data, but it just feels awkward to have them all in the same, all other bucket. And then I agree with Elizabeth on the different, um, well, residential buildings having such a, a large credit dis discrepancy. That that seems awkward to me. Um, then on the actual points, there was the partial electrification and the partial water heat or the maybe not partial, but the space water heat and the space. Um, electrification and 
uh, I don't have control of the document, so I can't scroll to it. But um, in the all other occupancies, we're not giving any credit to the electric space heating or electric space water heating. And I don't understand why we aren't allowing them to take credit for that. And that might just be, again, because of the wide variety of occupancies and it might really benefit some occupancies and not other occupancies. But I would think like a restaurant that uses a lot of energy, there would be opportunity for credits for going all electric there. Right. OK, that's really helpful. Does anyone else want to raise concerns? Or propose process ideas for this proposal? If not, maybe we can move to the other one. Okay, right. thank you all. Um, can I ask just uh, who's in this group? We have less stakeholders. This is a smaller group. Um, Elizabeth, you mentioned other energy modelers would be interested in this. Should we make a specific request when we're circling back on how this fits to get just a couple more folks to join that meeting who you think would like to see these numbers? Or like, just I wanted just to check like uh, who's here. Um, question just on this proposal since we have now decided we'll try to come back to it in your last meeting. Uh, yeah, I'd say at least for for our group that could just be emailed out for for folks to review and um, you know kind of at their leisure because that's that's a sort of thing that takes a little time to dig into uh, unless you wanted to do a quickie intro, but I think that could all just be done offline without trying to do a meeting. Great. So we will try to get everything out well in advance of that final meeting um, and maybe send to um, a slightly broader group if they if they want to review that ahead of, or join and then ask if they want to join that meeting. Does that sound good? Yeah, you know, and even if it's I don't know if you if you all are willing to to post it publicly, uh, you know, as a supplemental information. Uh, like next to the implementation plan, let folks know it's there. You know, at least then folks who do want to do their due diligence would have the opportunity to. Yep, that sounds good. It's everything for these working groups is posted publicly, so we will endeavor to just make sure we kind of pull all of that together and make it clear in one place. Um, perhaps it's just even too buried in the implementation plan, but we will also look at like, do we have something more in depth that we can share and we'll get that posted publicly and shared at least with the people in this group. Okay. Oh, and, and I just have one last um, okay. sort of comment question, and I guess this is an overreaching thing and, and that's to clarify to the committee, you know, whether we are mandated to achieve these goals or if it is partly up to the the committee to determine what the industry can actually handle without you know actually stopping construction in Denver and I honestly still don't know <laughs> you know if it's if it's just you know, thou shalt meet these goals and and figure out how to do it or if we're still even deciding on on whether the goals can be met I mean obviously I would prefer the former but um, I think that that may also just need to be clarified as to what what the committee is truly tasked with. Thanks. I mean, I think at the end of the day, the committee is trying to help us strike that balance. How fast can we go while still making things achievable? And so we were hoping to figure that out for this working group. I think that's why Sean asked that question. You know, this is going, you know, eight to 12 percent and better in terms of efficiency uh, with the kind of points that are proposed here. How do we help the committee inform that discussion? Well, I think a good example is was the uh, amendment about renewable energy, you know, where we proposed mandating a 20% energy offset with on-site renewables. And if you couldn't do that, you had to go to off-site renewables. Well, 
it doesn't it, it, it won't physically fit on the buildings. So do we need to mandate it even if it isn't physically possible? Or can we find a number that is actually um, achievable and feasible? Okay, let's turn to, that's a good introduction for our minimum renewable proposal. So Sean, <laughs> so you to introduce that because I think that's exactly the question is what should, or that was some of the key questions I heard from the larger committee for that proposal was, um, what should some of the options be where there isn't space to put solar on site? So, but let's introduce the proposal first. All right. So like the last one, we're going to start by taking a quick look at the impact. So for context, the proposal has in it, as Elizabeth mentioned, the 20% uh, minimum renewable energy uh, requirement. This also comes from the implementation plan. And if we look at the carbon impact of this requirement, we can see that it is substantial. <clears throat> when we look at it alone. One thing to keep in mind, since we have now looked at the impact of two uh, different proposals, the increase in stringency and the renewable energy, is that once we begin to look at them together, you know, it's not purely additive. There are some interactive effects. So you don't just add the, the, the drop from one to the other and that's your total. You have kind of a, a little bit of interaction between the two. But at 20% of the total energy usage of the building, you can see that the impact of a proposal like this is substantial. And we will go over to the proposal itself. One moment while I bring it up and make sure I'm showing you the right thing. All right, so this proposal starts with a series of definitions that are used in the language itself. I just want to make you aware that some of these things are defined. This is based largely on um, a proposal that is moving through the 2024 IECC right now. I'm not sure of the status on it, but um, we can get that if people need it. The proposal then has uh, just a little bit of documentation requirements since this is uh, these are new things that are going to be on the plans to making sure that they are on the plans for plan check and then we get into the bulk of and the real meat of the proposal which is to create this requirement that um, 20 percent of the building's annual energy use is provided by an on-site renewable energy system now, recognizing that that is not going to be possible on some buildings or perhaps not, um, you know, not feasible on some buildings, there is this provision that it can be achieved through offsite renewable energy. So unlike in C406, where if you want to get those renewable energy credits, they have to be from an on-site system, there is the opportunity for these to come from an off-site system, and these would be really provided through Excel and its offsite renewable energy um, programs, excuse me. And it's, I think the best way to think about this is that these offsite renewable energy options effectively create ownership of these offsite renewable systems so that they are more like what an onsite renewable system would actually be providing a building. So that's how it is. It's structured through an exception to be able to use the offsite. And then there's this series of requirements. And that's what you're seeing here in the numbers. And then just like uh, different building types are in different places when it comes to uh, what the code is actually delivering, um, that means that they also have different energy uses, which I think all of us kind of naturally understand um, um, looks like there's a, a typo in here, but this table creates what the includes what the requirement for on site renewable from a prescriptive standpoint is in the far right column. That middle column should be the off site renewable um, 
system requirements and it's set up in oh i'm sorry this is this is all showing on site it's the kbtu and and kilowatt hour so it shows you what the the requirement is prescriptively for on site and then there's another table for what it would be off site we see off site it is larger and that's because those off site don't come in full um, you know an on site system is going to last 20 to 30 years while the off site we're looking at contracts for a shorter period of time uh, in five year chunks. And so that's what is reflected in this column here I mean, in this table here. Um, the it is possible for a project to calculate its actual energy use through C407. So a project could either pres comply prescriptively using the, the numbers in these tables, recognizing that this probably isn't going to represent the actual energy use of specific projects. They can always calculate it specifically through C407 and do 20% of that. So those are the two main components of that, that there is you know, there's the overall stringency of this of this proposal, uh, how much on how much renewable energy offset is going to be required and then how that interaction with the offsite works. Right now, the, the proposal is structured so that it is mutually exclusive with any other renewable energy compliance options in the code. There are two places where you can use renewable energy to comply with the code. One is C406 that we just looked at. The other is for um, high output water heating systems. They have a compliance alternative that is based on renewable energy. So um, this, the way that this proposal is structured, you can't use the renewable energy for this requirements to also meet those other requirements. So there's no double counting. And are there any questions? Thanks, Sean. I think I'm just really interested to hear from the group, you know, their responses to your questions on well, how much should really be required, how to account for offsite if you can't do on site or what that alternative compliance looks like. Um, and whether or not that, you know, mutual exclusivity should be included or if that should be more lenient um, and therefore more encouraging of folks to pursue renewables. Certainly want to make sure we get to something that is attainable and that the code committee feels confident in uh, moving forward. Um, so thank you. We wait for folks to digest their thoughts. They can share another perspective here. Well, I think you know, the near term carbon benefit of these renewables is, is really substantial. Over time, as the grid gets cleaner, which Excel is counting on uh, distributed renewables to come onto the grid um, to help with our overall uh, cleaning of the grid, though they've unfortunately um, kind of overestimated that in the past and distributed renewables have not caught up with uh, expectations. Um, in the long run, you know, it's really the electrification of our buildings is going to have the most significant carbon impact long term. Um, and as the grid approaches, you know, 100% carbon free, whether through uh, renewables being required in, in code or not, you know, I, I try to think about well, let's say it's 2040. What is the role for renewables in every building? And let's make sure that that on-site requirement is really reflective of the value that um, it needs to provide, not just to hit a near-term GHG reduction target, but long-term sustainable grid operations. There needs to be some distributed renewables help avoid our dependence on long-distance transmission infrastructures that might spark wildfires or um, just generally have electrical inefficiencies as power is being transferred from you know one region to another. You know, how do we make sure we have an appropriate amount of distributed generation that can help 
really support the resilience of our city and the overall you know, grid benefits that those can provide. So I think it's useful for me, at least in my work, to be thinking about that kind of end state where the system's 100% carbon free and what role do distributed renewables really play in that. And this will hopefully be an incremental step to help us um, reach that goal. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, one of the questions I feel like I heard a lot from the committee when we reviewed these is uh, the availability of offsite too. So I feel like that's something we'll want to put on our our topic agendas to review as we move forward in these working groups. Is they really want to understand if we're requiring something of buildings, is it even possible for buildings to get these? Um, so I, I think just addressing that topic uh, is something very critical. And then to add on to that, uh, and I want to let others speak as well, but um, reflecting how electrification can be incentivized in this proposal too, because right now it's an exception, but you have to do two out of three to meet that. I'm wondering if there's possible if we can all elect buildings, an exemption is if you do that, you don't need to do additional efficiency as well as offsite. Uh, that's another topic I'd like to get into uh, some more as we move forward. Great, thanks, Courtney. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And you know, if the code committee is having hesitation on things, then certainly would be open to having that discussion on. Well, so long as you do electrification, you know, you've you've checked the box and have met your uh, compliance requirements because of what we see from that longer term carbon benefit. And that may help to assuage some of the uh, concerns about availability, although we do anticipate um, offsite renewables being available. Um, but it just will help out building owners uh, as they're thinking about compliance and new development. Elizabeth, I think I saw you come off mute. Do you want to chime in? Well, I know we're running short on time, so I'd love to hear from like you or Ian or Chuck or Eric or others on just what should we sort of be working on to maybe work on to bring back to you on these this proposal uh, in the next meeting. Sure. So we've had a mandatory solar requirement in Boulder for a few years now, and and have been working with that. Um, the requirement in Boulder is a five percent energy offset. And it's hard. Uh, I, I just had a meeting this morning <laughs> where I did an analysis of a three-story multifamily building. Uh, and to get 5% energy offset, offset for this building that is roughly 140,000 square feet, uh, they'll likely not be able to get under 100 kilowatts to, to do a 5% energy offset. Um, when I do some quickie you know, back of the envelope calculations here, your kilowatt hours per square feet per year do not align with 20% of the annual energy use offset calculated following energy modeling protocol. So I don't see those aligning at all. Um, I also am not a fan of mandating uh, anything. <laughs> I always prefer options. Um, I, I would prefer that the renewable energy goes into C406 and C407 and is not mandated. There is a bit of a unintended consequence of Boulder mandating solar in that as soon as you require that investment in that solar infrastructure, people then compare every building upgrade to what is the solar offset. Um, there's no ability for me to encourage folks to kind of push through that cost barrier and get down to not having to do solar. So as soon as they have to make that solar investment, you know, there there is less impetus then to do those higher performance systems because they're going to have to do solar anyway, and then solar becomes the cheaper option. So just, just so everyone knows that, that is a slightly unfortunate, unintended consequence, but it's not the end of the world. Um, but 5% of our energy use 
is is a big number. So I don't think that this little footnote here with 20% of our annual energy use, I don't think that's the right number. It does not align with the with our modeling experience as far as an energy offset. Uh, now, if we're looking at you know just electricity offset, maybe, uh, but energy offset, it it, it doesn't match. Um, also, if you hand calculate out these numbers here, um, it's physically impossible to fit 2.2 kilowatts per square foot per year on an eight-story building. So I I can't possibly support a code that isn't physically possible. I know, yes, there's an option to do offsite, but why even write a code that can never happen? So you know, why why would we set a set a target that can never be achieved? Um, I'll also tell you, I know uh, we've been talking about all this offsite renewable, all these lovely things. Uh, we've been trying to use offsite renewables for the green buildings ordinance projects since the green buildings ordinance came out. I have not had a single project be successful in utilizing those offsite solar requirements. It's just not available. So I don't see it being as available as projects would need if we cannot physically do the on-site. So if you have every new construction project having to do off-site renewables, and then that option is now gone, we now have a code that can't possibly be enforced. So what do we do? I don't know. <laughs> so I just don't think that this is written um, for reality in a number of reasons. Um, I don't think that 20% is the right number. I don't think the on-site numbers are aligned with what can physically happen. Um, and if if none of it makes sense, why not take it out altogether, put it in C406 so the projects that can do greater solar can then be rewarded in C406 and C407, and those that can't have other options to meet the code. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's really helpful feedback. Um, Chuck or others, I know we're at time, but if folks need to hop off, you can. If others just want to take a minute and chime in, um, that would help us to set your next agenda and think through sort of what to do next with this proposal. Um, I was just going to second what uh, Elizabeth was saying is how achievable is this and how do we compare globally with some of this stuff? It just seems like a lot of this is speculation. And it's just really uh, setting up for a recipe for, for disaster. We can't get people to go for the code now. And if we are that far out of stream, um, have we done any further research or knowing where this is going to come or where it's going to go? Anybody have an answer to that? Obviously, aside from the chart, we get all that, but uh, it just seems like the numbers are real speculative. Thank you. I think that was Ian. Is that right? Uh, San Antonio, Navarre. Oh, I'm sorry. It I'm just sorry. I have a bad connection here, so hopefully you guys can hear me. That's helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, does anybody can you else? Can you guys hear talk? me? I got a bad connection here, so. Yeah, I think we heard all of your comment, and for some reason, it just didn't pop up to show who it was that was talking, and I couldn't tell. Um, yeah. So, anybody else want to chime in, and then we'll wrap this one up. I mean, I'll just echo my comments from the previous proposal, but I think just the the substantiation behind the numbers is is critical. Like, is the twenty percent where the twenty percent come from? Is it just to meet the Denver's goal at twenty thirty, or was there actually a, a feasibility study across different occupancy building types that showed that that was achievable? And what is achievable look like? What is the cost of on site? versus offsite, what is that additional cost? Because I know during the code committee, the idea of offsite sort of um, indicated a, a non asset for the building that they needed to invest in. And so I, I think that was an interesting comment that the onsite is something they it's it becomes an asset for the building where offsite maybe isn't so much. Um, and then the required onsite, where'd those numbers come from? Is that I mean, Elizabeth says that they run the numbers and it doesn't seem to make sense. Is there substantiation that we've done on our side to justify these numbers and show that they make sense um, physically and feasibility, the feasibility, uh, the substantiation that they should be achievable? So I think those are the those are the numbers 
that I think the committee would want to see and that this small group would want to see to, to digest for sure. Chuck, you're so good at putting that into words. You took the thoughts right out of my mouth. Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in and then we'll let everyone go because I know we're over. OK, Thanks, this everybody. is really but yeah, this is really helpful. We'll let everyone go. We'll think about sort of what next steps should be um, and may just do real quick check ins with a couple of you offline on kind of what should happen with this proposal. But mostly we will um, make some plans and we'll talk to you again uh, soon. Thank you all. Thank you.